Hello and welcome to the Drake Expanse. I'm Mitch the Quack and I hope you're having a less quack day than myself. Today we're going to be talking about the Nathrazine and their possible origins. I will then follow that up with a timeline depicting how the Jailer seems to have been trying to destroy the universe since its early stages and how the Nathrazine may have played a role in aiding in that destruction. I'll also say now, this theory was supposed to be about the Nathrazine and in part it still is. However, this theory eventually comes back to what I believe the Jailer's plans have been. So let's start with the obvious. Ever since the Features trailer and the reveal of Revendreth, I and many others were basically asking the question, are we going to find out about the origins of the Nathrazim in the Shadowlands? I mean, between the Venthyr looking like the origin species that make up the Nathrazim, the raid being called Castle Nathria, which seems like a pretty obvious slap in the face, and the fact that if you look carefully enough you can see the same faceless statues guarding the Dark Portal in the Venthyr Covenant, which as I have previously speculated may have some relation to Nathrazim, it appears pretty obvious we are going to learn about them in Revendreth. There are just a few big problems with that entire thought process. The main one being, how do you explain Nathraza, the apparent home of the Nathrazim, and how do you explain the Nathrazim being demons? The answer is pretty simple. The Nathrazim are Venthyr that ended up in the Twisting Nether and were transformed into Nathrazim. I know that must sound like I'm taking the piss, but it really is that simple. If you want to create an Athrazim, expose a Venthyr to a large amount of fell slash disorder magic, and you'll get the desired result. And where I know that seems too simple, there's actually lore to prove this. In Anima and the Machinery of Death, I mentioned the idea that if a creature lacks Vita, then that creature's physical form can be changed. In that content, I also touched on the fact that the Six Magics may have a similar effect. To further explain that, basically if you overload a creature with enough magic, that creature will take on a form from that school of magic. In more recent lore, we see this in Stormsong Valley with Samuel Williams, who was turned into Ajdathul the Drowned. Lord Stormsong basically drowns Samuel in shadow magic, forcibly turning him into a faceless, and I just want to point out, this was done in the physical universe, a place where Vita is seemingly abundant. I mean, Samuel's Vita, or possibly his resistance to shadow magic, was probably reduced due to him nearly being turned into Kathia earlier in the Stormsong Valley questline, but either way, this happened to a creature from a realm and in a realm with an abundance of Vita. So it's not that unbelievable that something similar could happen to a creature of mainly anima like the Venthyr. Now, I know there are differences between shadow and fell energy, demons and faceless. However, to prove this is how demons are created, we need to go back to everyone's favourite expansion, Wad. Now, when I first saw this, I didn't believe it, and that's saying something because I'm a quack, I discount very few things. In northeastern Frostfire Ridge, within the Gloom Spire, Horde players as a part of the Khadgar questline observe this. Your time has come. What? No! Have fun dealing with this. I'm more beautiful than ever! Now, just so we're on the same page, yes, that was an orc being turned into a Shavara. Meaning, yes, creating a demon is actually surprisingly easy. Now, I am unsure what dictates a demon's shape, but I assume there are a lot of things that dictate what type of demon a creature turns into. Overall, however, we definitely know how demons are created. I mean, technically, this was mentioned in Chronicle Volume 1 ages ago, in reference to how the Nathrazim twisted mortal races into new types of demons. I just never knew how literal the statement was, and until the reveal of Revendreth, I didn't realise the same was applicable to the Nathrazim as well. If you're also after a third example of something like this possibly happening within another magic, I would highly suggest watching this speculation by Akalon. I mean, I would suggest watching it anyway because it gives a very good insight into what could be happening to Sylvanas, but the same principle of magic overload is present. So the Nathrazim are basically fell exposed Venthyr. If I was to guess, this exposure is the reason why demons and the Nathrazim go to the Twisting Nether when they die. It's because when they are exposed to the chaotic energies of the realm, their spirits are tied to that realm. As for the regeneration aspect of the Twisted Nether, 
your guess is as good as mine. I can only assume a demon soul regenerates because the Twisting Nether is basically a melting pot of the magics of creation. Maybe. Probably. And in turn, has the property of regenerating its denizens. I should also mention now, the Nathrazim might not be the only Shadowland species to have been exposed to a specific type of magic that changed their form. Actually, no, I'm certain they're not. I'm just going to save the more convincing idea for its own theory, which it will need. In the meantime, I ask this. What do the Night Fae remind you of? When I first saw them, I thought Draenei, then Satyrs, but then mainly Draenei and Eridar. And maybe I'm the only one who sees it, but if the Night Fae are in some way related to the Draenei, in a similar fashion to the Venthyr being related to the Nathrazim, except arcane magic being the catalyst for the change, assumedly, the question for me that comes to mind is, okay, Argus was connected to death, but if he was similar to Azroth, then he wasn't just connected to one type of death. And so the question is, what type of death was Argus connected to? And if not what type of death, then was Argus connected to Ardenwald, specifically, and did Sargeras twist him into the state we saw him in? Implying yes, he was a death titan, but not always, and or necessarily, the Unmaker. The Ender of Worlds, etc, etc. Anyway, back to the Nathrazim. Where I may have explained the mechanical how, as in how did the Venthyr turn into the Nathrazim, we now move on to the more interesting, far-reaching, and frankly, mess of a why. Because everything I've said is well and dandy, but we still don't have a reason for why the Venthyr would have gone to the Twisting Nether, or even how they got there. This is where the biggest assumption of this theory comes into play. I think the Venthyr, once upon a time, served the Jailer. Then, a war with the Arbiter happened, and some of the Venthyr betrayed the Jailer, ensuring his defeat. I think the Venthyr that were still loyal to the Jailer somehow escaped to the Twisting Nether, never wavering their loyalty to the Jailer, and set out on a millennia-long plan to either fulfill the Jailer's wish in destroying the universe, or setting the Jailer free. Now, I need to explain that assumption and preface what comes next. The assumption I just made is one of 10 plus scenarios that could have taken place, from the Venthyr being on the Arbiter's side, to something happening after the Arbiter had taken control of the Shadowlands. There are way too many scenarios that could have happened. I mean, I can't even assure you the Nathrazim were loyal to the Jailer, and don't just happen to have a similar goal. The reason I'm starting with the assumption the Nathrazim are loyal is because of A, the Helm of Domination, which I'll mention later, B, the legendary unholy DK weapon Apocalypse, which seems to be as old as Nathrazim and has overt references to death. I would also say the legendary blood DK weapon, the More of the Damned, had something to do with this decision, but whatever Nylum was, or whatever happened during that battle, seems to be separate from the Moor. But then again, the battle did apparently scar vast stretches of reality. See, the faceless statues of Nathrazim seemingly used for power or worship in the physical universe. As pointed out before, they turn up in Revendreth, and as pointed out to me by Roy Owen, who mentioned this in one of the comments of my previous theories, also seem to be a part of the Tower of Torghast, or at least the concept art. D, assuming the Nathrazim are loyal to the Jailer, is a good starting off point. But, by the end of this theory, the other possibilities will become very relevant, and most likely change your opinion. So, just keep that in mind. And E, if a conflict was the reason why the Venthyr ended up in the Twisting Nether, I would take a bet it had something to do with the creation story at the start of Chronicle Volume 1, and why it's structured in such a vague manner. Okay, with out of the way, what makes it clear the Nathrazim could have been loyal to the Jailer? Well, if the Jailer wants to destroy the universe, and the Nathrazim are Venthyr, that somehow followed the Jailer's will since the beginning of the universe, through those faceless statues, then it just happens there's just enough lore provided to create a timeline of how the efforts of the Nathrazim have intertwined and benefited the actions of the Jailer. The timeline starts with, quite literally, the explanation of what the demons wanted, when they first entered the physical universe. As in, the second mentioning of demons in Chronicle goes as follows. The Pantheon's attention was consumed by another, more immediate threat. Demons. These ferocious creatures had been born from the Twisting Nether. Which is technically true. Held in the thrall of unbridled hate and malice, they hungered for nothing less than the destruction of all life. So, 
Rather ironically, this information isn't hidden, it's rather blunt. Since day one, demons have basically been trying to destroy everything. I'm willing to say this was in the name of the Jailer, or at the very least, the Nathrazim were a part of this carnage at the behest of the Jailer. Their plan being to create more demons, to cause more destruction and death. One other possible reason for these incursions may have been a search to find and or more likely gain a better understanding of how shadow magic works. I only suggest this because Chronicle Volume 1 makes a point to say the Nathrazim dedicated their existence to mastering shadow magic. Which when thought about is an interesting plot point. Because we know the Nathrazim have always had a connection to Fel because they're demons. There have also been hints in lore about them experimenting with death magic for eons. So why would shadow magic be their focus? Is it because it's the only magic they could master? Or is it something else? Assuming the Nathrazim were loyal to the Jailer, I would guess shadow magic might have something to do with how the Jailer was imprisoned. I mean, it's obvious from what we've seen, the Jailer seems to have been imprisoned by his own magic, or something very similar to it. Hence why Sylvanas has control of the chains of death, but also why the Jailer seems to be imprisoned by them. Now, with this logic in mind, and the previously mentioned ideas about the Nathrazim, hints at the Jailer's imprisonment having something to do with the creation of the universe become apparent. As in, think of something along the lines of Demon Hunters. The idea being that the first creatures of Shadow embraced portions of the Jailer's power, so creation had the ability to imprison him, but at the same time, sealed their fate as darkened creatures forever. I have no proof of this speculation by the way, it's just an idea spawned from a description that for me stood out, and actually leads on to the next big point on the timeline. The Nathrazim were unsuccessful in destroying the universe. The Titans, specifically Sargeras, a creature more powerful than the demons, stepped in and stopped them, imprisoning most of the demons in Mardum. However, some of the Nathrazim found the shadow magic they were looking for, and also happened across a sleeping titan. This next part is well known. Sargeras finds a sleeping titan, corrupted by the shadow. He finds the Nathrazim on the planet, interrogates them and finds out about the Void Lords and their plans to corrupt a sleeping titan which results in Sargeras cleaving the world in two, killing the world soul, and generally beginning his march to madness. Now, without the context of the Jailer, this is an important event. However, with the context of the Jailer, this event becomes insanely important. The reason I say that is because just a few pages prior, we are told that Nathrazim relish in sowing unrest and turning nations against one another, as well as twisting innocence into new horrific breeds of demons. Couple this with the possibility of the Nathrazim being followers of the Jailer, and the result of their actions becomes very clear. Creation of the Mad Titan was most likely the Nathrazim's greatest work, and the Jailer's greatest move in this 40 chess match for the universe, as it managed to literally turn the universe on itself. I think Sargeras was told half-truth. I think he was told precisely what would happen if a Shadow Titan was created a titan ruled by the magic that influenced its power, instead of the will that comes from its own soul. What I think the Nathrazim expertly left out though, was the same could be said for any titan. Any titan that loses control of its magic would consume all matter and energy in the universe, bringing every mode of existence under the magic and the creatures of that magic the titan is aligned to. In the case of the shadow, it would be the void lords. In the case of the light, something else. The list goes on. It does not matter what magic is used, the result is the same. Because as is said, six seats at the high table, six mouths at hunger, one will consume all others. And once that happens, and the balance is lost, true darkness gains the advantage once again, and returns to end everything. I mean, even in Chronicle, the Titans referred to Sagaris falling to darkness. Not the shadow, darkness. And where I know Sargeras' interrogation should have gotten the truth out of the Nathrazim. If Varimathras' attitude when we find him is any indication of how well Nathrazim take torture, then Sargeras probably never broke the Nathrazim he tortured. So, just to be clear at this point, the Nathrazim set in motion a universal civil war with one side being led by their own twisted creation, the mad titan Sargeras, who was convinced all life should end, and whose goal of scouring the universe lines up perfectly with the Jailer's goal, 
The creation of the Mad Titan and eventually the Legion also gave the Nathrazim a smokescreen to orchestrate the Jailer's escape. There is also one other thing I think the Nathrazim learned during their time on the Corrupted Titan. That information was the notion of Titan World Souls and the fact you could corrupt them, which they specifically learnt from observing the Shadow and the Old Gods. And where at first this didn't mean much because they had their own Titan Sargeras doing what they strove for without even knowing, eventually this information would prove to be invaluable. Though before you think it, I don't think this information became useful with Argus, unless there's something else about Argus that directly relates to the Jailer. I assume Argus, for the most part, was ignored by the Jailer and left to Sargeras' machinations. The reason being that when Argus fell, Sargeras and the Burning Legion seemed to be the mightiest force in the universe. If Argus was monopolised by Sargeras and used to fuel the Legion and become a weapon of destruction, it didn't matter to the Jailer. Its goal would have been achieved regardless. All it needed was patience. Before we move on to the next event in the timeline, the first query as to whether the Nathrazim were actually loyal to the Jailer turns up around this plot point. Ulathesh, the Nathrazim who came to rule the demons inside Mardum, refused Sargeras' call to end the universe. If this theory is correct, and the Nathrazim were acting on the Jailer's behalf, assumedly Ulathesh would have chosen to side with Sargeras. He didn't. So at this point we at the very least have an indication not all the Nathrazim were united. P.S. For those who have watched the Jailer leaked content, the discovery of Sargeras and a Titan World Soul would be more along the lines of a rediscovery on the Jailer's part, with the Jailer's intent most likely staying the same. The Jailer just knew from then on it had to deal with old foes. The next event of the timeline pulls away from the Nathrazim for a bit and focuses on the Titan's invasion of the Black Empire specifically on Yogg-Saron. In previous content, I assumed Yogg-Saron tapped into some form of death to create Sauronite, a mineral made from Yogg-Saron's blood which seemed to have the properties of death and shadow magic. I still believe that to be true, however, with the reveal of the Jailer, the question of when and why has been thrown into question. I thought Yogg willingly went looking for death magic, and thought he did so because he wanted power. That still might be the case, however there is one other possibility that explains something in Chronicle Volume 1 that for me initially made no sense. When the Titans invaded Azeroth, it described how they caught the Black Empire off guard, and devastated the northernmost holdings of the Black Empire, scouring the Old God minions and temples. Now, unless North and South got rearranged after the Black Empire, that event is describing the Titan Forged decimating Yogg-Saron's territory. Though, as most of you know, that doesn't make much sense considering Yogg was the last Old God to be imprisoned, and out of the remaining three was considered the most dangerous. So, what happened? What allowed Yogg to fight back and apparently regain some dominance in the North? I'd argue it was the Jailer. I think yogg Saron was nearly killed in the Titan's first strike, and out of desperation started siphoning death magic to sustain itself. I think of all the forms of death it could have tapped into, it specifically tapped into the Moor and started having to deal with the Jailer. Now, how much influence the Jailer actually had over Yogg-Saron is debatable. I mean, I wouldn't be shocked in the slightest if an old god could handle a limited amount of the Moor's power. This also would have made Yogg-Saron, in part, the original Jailer of the Damned, as at this point, to our knowledge, this is the first time a connection to the Moor had been established. However, if the Jailer did have influence over Yogg-Saron, well, I think you can imagine how much that would change everything that happened with the Keepers. I will say though, the only proof I have of this is the fact Yogg-Saron, for no apparent reason, has a Valkyr hovering above him during the Alduar encounter. And in contrast, there is a myriad of proof that shows the Jailer's Lich King, Ner'zhul, and Yogg-Saron did not get along. The best example of this is the War of the Spiders. Overall, this encounter between Yogg-Saron and the Jailer most likely weakened the Veil in the North, setting up the foundations of what was to come millennia later. The next part of the timeline focuses on Odin, Helia, and the creation of the first Valkyr on Azeroth. It has been confirmed that the Dark Entity that made a deal with Odin for his eye was not the Jailer. Instead, it was an agent of the Jailer, and we are apparently going to find out about why this deal occurred and its ramifications in the Shadowlands. 
However, I don't think we need to wait that long to answer at least some of the questions related to why the Jailer set this deal in motion. The Jailer seemingly needs Valkyr to enact his plan. The question is, considering how Valkyr are created, can the Jailer or its direct servants in the Damned create Valkyr? At present, I would argue no. The reason being, the magic of the Moor does not seem to be equipped to do so. What I'd say the Jailer can do though, is corrupt Valkyr but I'd assume he can only do so to those Valkyr that are not under the influence of the Arbiter or a strong will. Similar to how the Nerubians were immune to the Lich King's mind control, not because they were immune, but because they were already under the influence of Yogg-Saron. I also want to add, the Jailer might not be able to create Valkyr directly, but I think he can create them through proxy, as in partially corrupt another creature from another magic that can do so, and use that creature to create the Valkyr. This is where Odin playing the fool comes into play. Discovering there was a keeper wanting to see into the Shadowlands, I think the Jailer banked on or knew Odin needed creatures like the Valkyr and so would look into Bastion and mimic the process the Kiri had practice, with the intent of creating his own spirit healers detached from Bastion and the Arbiter. Obviously, the Jailer guessed right, or the weakened Veil of Northrend helped provide him insight because that's exactly what Odin did. This is where the story of Odin and Helia becomes interesting. There are two stories of how Helia became the first Valkyr. One fully blames Odin. The other blames Helia and shows how morally bankrupt Odin is. Now, prior to the reveal of the Jailer, I was inclined to believe the story that blamed Odin. However, after long conversations about this subject with Locke from Shines and Lucky Doos, I am now inclined to believe both stories. And let's just say, when you do, you realise how horribly Helia and Odin managed to screw each other over. Helia knew of the Shadowlands. She had studied them. It was why she could warn Odin about them. So, assumedly, Helia knew everything we're currently learning about the Shadowlands and her denial of Odin probably had something to do with the drought the Shadowlands is experiencing thanks to the Moor. Why am I certain of this? During the What's Next panel, we got a look at the Drust section of Ardenwald. To me, the place looks like it's dying, and I think when we start to explore the zone, we are going to find out it has been in drought and dying a lot longer than any other zone. Because inexplicably, a long time ago, the spirits that usually went to the Drust suddenly stopped. And as you can already guess, I think the cause of this was Odin and Heli's feud and the creation of Helheim and the Halls of Valor. And yes, I am implying I think the Vrykul, not just the ones that ended up in Kolthras, and in turn some of the humans, if not all humans as a whole, have ties to the Drust. Or, more precisely, the Vrykul on Kol Taras didn't discover the Drust's magic. They instead rediscovered it. But I need to stay on topic. Helia, for good reason, denies Odin, and chooses to return the Halls of Valor. And this causes them to get into a fight. During this fight, Helia does something stupid. She tries calling on the power of the Shadowlands and seems to tap into the power of the Moor. Similar to Yogg, but instead of controlling it, she gets dragged in. Odin does save her, but not before Helia begins to turn into, or already has turned into, one of the damned. This probably explains Helia's screams of anguish that permeated Azroth and the Shadowlands. The next part of this story is so morally great it's actually infuriating. Odin turns Helia into a Valkyr, apparently to save her from transforming into, and or being, one of the damned. I'm not sure whether this confirms you can save people from being damned, but even so, being a spirit healer for eternity doesn't sound that nice either. And from there, things just keep getting trickier, because Odin then bound Helia to his will, which on the outset I would quite easily argue was a dick move, but we know the Jailer can corrupt Valkyr, so there is the possibility Odin had to bind Helia to his will otherwise she would have fallen under the sway of the Jailer anyway. I would also be willing to say, considering how the Kyrian creates spirit healers and Odin having control over lightning, Helia lost part of her memory during this entire encounter, specifically the parts leading up to and during the confrontation. After Helia is bound, Odin's moral bankruptcy finally starts to shine through though. Instead of telling Helia the truth, I think Odin lied to her. For millennia in the name of protecting Azeroth and his dream of a Valishar army. I think he made Helia believe she either chose her position as a Valkyr, or that she was the only person to blame for her current state. 
the lie would eventually crumble and would be the reason why Loken and Yuxaron could use Helia as a pawn to lock away the Halls of Valor and bring down the Keepers. This is where I think the Jailer, after patiently waiting, finally made its move. I think similar to its other servants, the Jailer slowly but surely twisted the anger Helia had for Odin after such a depraved betrayal into possibly hatred for everything living, if not at the very least Azeroth. The result was Helia's knowing or unknowing servitude to the Jailer, which has had major repercussions. These repercussions being in no particular order, small amounts of anima being passed into the Moor, most likely through Helheim and the Moor of Souls, the crippling of one of the defensive forces of the Shadowlands and the Drust, as Odin did choose them for being unyielding warriors, so it would not be that surprising if they were the defense force of Ardenwald, confirmation that creatures of the physical universe can be turned into and create spirit healers outside of the Arbiter's influence, knowledge of something very important I'll mention later, and the creation of the Cavaldir, who seem to be one of the armies of the Jailer, firstly being used to disrupt Odin's plans, and later being used to counter the Shadow's presence through the Naga within Azeroth's oceans post-Sundering. Speaking of which is where the timeline moves to next, the Sundering. Now, I could not find any evidence to suggest the Jailer was behind the Sundering, other than its hands in the Burning Legion, and the slim possibility it had some influence over Yogg-Saron. So the lead up and the events of the Sundering, in my opinion, was all old gods. In the initial aftermath, however, there is an indication of the Jailer's presence, or at least I think there is, as I think the Jailer tried to grab Ajara as she was about to die. But then Nazoth stepped in, making the deal that saved her life. I also think this is how Ajara and possibly Nazoth found out about the darkness of the Jailer if yogg was the only old god to know of its presence at that point. Overall though, the Sundering changed everything for the Jailer and the Nathrazine, because the Legion was defeated. The Titan that had stopped the demon incursions and the Jailer's first plan, the Titan the Nathrazine went out of their way to convert, had been thwarted by another Titan, or more precisely, the mortal children of that Titan. There is another possibility here about how the Legion was stopped, but that goes into who the Arbiter could possibly be, and it's a subject that needs its own theory. Either way, a place the Jailer had known about for eons, a place that had shown little promise other than Helia and the Gavaldia, had suddenly proven to be an extremely powerful and exploitable asset. And I think, following the trend of moving to the next most powerful force in the universe, the Jailer set sights on Azeroth, though this time, it would kill two birds with one stone. You know how I mentioned the Jailer gained some very important knowledge from Helia? I think that knowledge was the ability to properly corrupt Titans, not just tricking them into doing his bidding. When the Jailer first learnt of corrupting Titan World Souls, I think it either A, didn't think it was necessary as it had the Legion and Sargeras, so never focused an Atherazim on it, or B, ever since driving Sargeras mad, had been looking for a way to do so, but could never achieve the goal. Argus may have been a failed attempt to corrupt a world soul with the Jailer's power, or possibly was deemed useless due to its weakness in the face of the Legion, and as mentioned, was left to Sargeras' machinations. Either way, the Jailer knew it was possible, but didn't have a method to corrupt a Titan, and Helia, assumedly after the Sundering, provided him with a method. Now, I'm not sure what this method is, but I do think it is a thing. Why? Harboron from the Moor of Souls. Harboron, from what's said about him, seems to be a Constella, creatures who share a very similar structure to the Titans as they are both made out of constellations. Zalatath expressly mentions that she's surprised one of his kind, Harboron, was corruptible. The reason I think she mentions this is because it's similar to grown Titans, I don't think Constellas are meant to be corruptible. I think similar to Titans, unless they revert to their world soul forms, Constellas are meant to be eternal creatures that are not supposed to change. Yet, as is seen with Harboron, they can change and be corrupted by death magic. Meaning Helia, for the most part, likely found a way to corrupt a Titan world soul, if not just a fully grown Titan. From here, all the Jailer needed was access to the most powerful Titan, Azeroth, so it could fulfill its goals. P.S. If you've watched the Jail Elites content, then this part of the theory may seem a bit off and or ill-informed. I wrote this script before the Jailer was revealed, but don't worry, there is an explanation behind 
what the Jailer wants Azeroth for other than corrupting her, and I'll touch on that at the end of the theory. Now, continuing on, the reason the Jailer wants to corrupt Azeroth other than the significant power gain leads on to one of the original wishes of the first Lich King, a creature that was most likely under the direct influence of the Jailer, and a point in the timeline that will either solidify the Nathrezim as being a part of a universe and a conspiracy, or make them out to be one of the most arrogant and foolish creatures in creation that have basically ensured the end of the universe. The implication is, when Nazul's broken spirit was passed through death by Kil'jaeden, it was apparently passed, at least partially, through the Moor, while the Nathrezim stole or forged the armor of the Lich King and the Frostmorn out of materials from the Moor. This also does imply the Nathrezim had access to the Moor. The result was the first Lich King, a creature of immense power that thought it had some semblance of freedom to at least hate its captors, but in reality was a pawn specifically designed to serve the Jailer's will. I think that will manifested in one of the Lich King's wishes to have a body so he could be free to roam the universe. Now, as I just pointed out, I think it's possible one of the end goals of the Jailer, other than the destruction of everything, is to corrupt Azeroth. Why? Well, if the Lich King's want to be free is related to the Jailer, then other than controlling the most powerful Titan in the universe, I'd assume Azeroth would serve as a very accommodating body for the Jailer. Now, moving forward with the knowledge the Jailer has been around since day one, there is additional context to add to the creation of the Lich King. Assuming the Nathrezim were loyal to the Jailer, what the Nathrezim managed to do in this instance was play Kill Jaden like a violin. They basically managed to create a weapon and armor set for their troop master's power with Kill Jaden's help and blessing. Now, could Kill Jaden have been in on this conspiracy, specifically allowing the Jailer a foothold in the universe for the express purpose of killing Sargeras after the reality of the Legion started to sink in? Depending on how canon you think his entrance into the Sunwell raid was, the answer could go either way. I mean, it's a possible yes he knew about the Jailer and wanted to use its power against Sargeras, but I would still argue he had no comprehension of the scope of the Jailer's power and how cunning the creature is. Within this specific possibility, I'd also argue the Lich Kid's creation was specifically designed to capitalize on the fact yogg saron had made a connection to the Moor in Ice Crown on Azeroth. In a similar fashion to Helheim, I think Frostmourne was also partially feeding the Moor. Couple this with the weakened veil around Ice Crown caused by yogg saron and the creation of ICC, which seems to have been a massive conduit this entire time, what well, the Jailer basically created with all these elements in one spot was a perfect point of entry into the physical universe while simultaneously corrupting Azeroth. I'll also address this now. I once thought ICC was created by the Titans and reshaped by the Nathrezim and the Nerubians. I want to say I'm wrong. Almost all the research I've done says I was wrong. The glacier from Ice Crown seems to have been created by the Titans, but the creation of the tower itself seems to have been specifically related to the Jailer. And it makes sense. The pillar of ice in the middle of ICC is probably a conduit draining the energy or placing death energy within Azeroth, created retroactively by the followers of the Jailer. But then I noticed this, and if you're wondering why I have a picture of the Broken Isles up, watch this. I don't know if this is actually a thing or just a really odd coincidence. I only found it by accident when researching this theory, but the fact we are first introduced to trees that have canopies that look like stars in Suramar, similar to what is specifically supposed to turn up in Ardenwald, and the fact Arcaris could have been placed anywhere on the map, but for some reason was placed in the position that makes this pentagon a thing, not mentioning Bastion and Ardenwald being next to each other, and the Halls of Valor and Stormhind's overt connection to Bastion, it's all too convenient. If you're also curious how I justify the Moor being related to the Eye of Ajara even though it appeared over ICC, first statement I have is two portals, one destination. Two portals can lead to the same destination, especially when you're dealing with interdimensional travel. The second statement is Sylvanas destroyed the helm, not ICC, which for me implies she could have broken that helm anywhere on Azeroth, and Torghast would have appeared in the sky. 
she just chose to broker it over ICC, which may or may not have had a natural connection to the moor thanks to York Saron. Not mentioning there is no explanation as to why the area was so important to the Naga and the Shadow before Legion, and why Seathraxi and Naga would be set up in the area. I mean, considering the theme of the area, it makes me wonder if the Cavaldia had a presence in the area prior to the Naga moving in. Now, what could this quote unquote coincidence mean other than overtly hinting at who the Arbiter could be? The answer is one of the plan the Jailer attempted before the Lich King. A plan that ruined a planet and may make you feel sorry for a character you really shouldn't feel sorry for, Gul'dan. When making this theory, I was racking my brain trying to figure out whether the Jailer had any influence on Draenor, and if so, why? Until, once again, Locke from Chinese and Lucky Doos reminded me of the Black Temple, where those faceless statues are literally everywhere. And who was the person who just happened to redecorate the Black Temple with those statues? And the person on alternate Draenor excavating those statues? Gul'dan. The question from here became, how and why is the Jailer involved? And I tell you now, this is where things get interesting. Remember how I mentioned Kil'jaeden may have been in on the Jailer's plans? Well, Chronicle Volume 2 goes out of its way to state he was the one who taught Gul'dan necromancy and showed him how to create the first necrolites. Orc necromancers which eventually led to the creation of the first known Death Knights on Azeroth. And if you haven't looked at the original Terran Gore Fiend recently, I would highly suggest doing so. He has a feature that is shockingly distinct and similar to a set of creatures taking a spotlight in Shadowlands. I will still say though, even with Kil'jaeden being the catalyst for the Necrolites, I still think he and Gul'dan were being played by the Jailer, in particularly Gul'dan, and the reason why it goes back to a concept very prevalent in World of Warcraft. We know magics can mark mortals for certain destinies. Illidan and Malfurion are probably the best examples of this. From birth, they were destined for greatness, and both have generally achieved that in separately saving Azeroth on different occasions. Here's the thing. If life and light can mark mortals, who says death can't? Who says Gul'dan didn't get the short end of the stick, and was cursed by the Jailer from birth to fulfill a destiny of darkness and destruction? Why would the Jailer do this? Well, at this point, the Sundering has happened, and the Legion has been defeated specifically by mortals that had been marked by greater forces. So what I propose is the Jailer attempted the same thing, and Gul'dan was the unfortunate soul to be cursed, possibly explaining why he had been disfigured from birth, why the elements knew he could never be redeemed, why Gul'dan could become so powerful, and possibly why his skull after death could hold so much power. It would also give a nice explanation as to why Gul'dan of all people knew death would inherit the world, and possibly what Gul'dan saw in the collapsing portal, if it accidentally redirected itself to the moor. I mean, could you imagine being shown a glimpse of the Cosmic Boogeyman, a presence you had felt all your life but dismissed, to then not only be shown it's real, but to come to the realisation your aspirations for power that saw you commit the most depraved acts, and even had you bend the knee to those you despise were never your own, that you were a pawn your whole life in a game you could barely comprehend. To me, that would make someone like Gul'dan give up. But I know. The question from here is, but why Gul'dan? Why not a creature on Azeroth, which, as you stated before, was the Jailer's goal after the Sundering? He had Helia and other agents, why not use them? I'll probably end up repeating this a few more times, but I seriously think his other forces were dealing with other possible threats. If this theory is correct, the fact that Kovaldi and the Naga have been trying to kill each other for so long should be ample proof there are battles across Azeroth we haven't even heard of that most likely involve other cosmic forces. As for the why Gul'dan and Draenor, if I was to guess, it probably had something to do with Draenor's Veil being overall weaker than Azeroth's due to the fall of Naru which had arrived at least 150 years prior to Gul'dan's birth with the Draenei. It's quite apparent on alternate Draenor, the Shadowmoon had methods of reaching the Shadowlands, thanks to the Dark Star's influence. And it's doubtful the influence of three fallen Naru, which is apparently a very rare occurrence in of itself, didn't affect Draenor's Veil as a whole. Now the question from here is, what's the purpose? You have a marked mortal by the Jailer on another world. What's the plan? 
The plan, I kid you not, was most likely to use Sargeras's long game with Aegwyn to acquire the staff of Sargeras and quite literally rip the veil, similar to Sylvanas, with Gul'dan. The reason this is possible is if the Jailer was the cause of the Legion, I would be willing to say it knew about most, if not all, of the plans going on, especially if the Nathrazim were working for him. And where it said the Orcs seemingly came out of nowhere and just happened to line up perfectly with Sargeras' plan, if your Jaden was being manipulated as much as I think he was, then the Draenei were the excuse the Jailer needed to manipulate his pawns into working together. The goal being to create another dark army like the Kvaldir that by proxy do precisely what the Jailer wanted on Azeroth. And frankly, the plan for the most part worked perfectly. The Orcs ended up on Azeroth thanks to Sargeras. However, due to the strategy that was being employed, Legion's control of the Orcs was minimal and Gul'dan, for the most part, almost had a free run on the Tomb of Sargeras and the Staff, which after finding that quote-unquote coincidence, seems to suggest the original plan was to rip a hole to the Moor somewhere over the Broken Isle. Whether it be the Isle of Ishara, the Moor of Souls, the Temple of the Loon, I don't think it would have mattered as I'd swear the whole Isle had some natural connection to the Shadowlands in the past. The plan obviously went wrong when Gul'dan fell into a coma thanks to Medivh's death. But then the bigger problem came when Sargeras killed Gul'dan, which looking at the circumstances may have been the Jailer's last straw with the Legion and prompted a plan of self-sufficiency. What I mean by that is, with Gul'dan dead and no staff, I think the Jailer needed a new plan. That plan ended up being Ner'zhul. Why? Well, on the contradictory assumption the Death Knights Gul'dan created were the first Death Knights in the universe, or at the very least a new type of Death Knight, the Jailer, from its marked mortal, learnt a new method of creating undead minions. The task then was twofold. Quote unquote, suggest the creation of the Lich King to kill Jaden, a weapon that would create an ever obedient army which would never fall to the infighting of the Horde through the Nathrazim, a weapon that, secretly, the Jailer could use and eventually gain control of. And the joke is, the Jailer had the perfect catalyst to get that plan started. Nazul's fall to Lich King starts with Terran Gorefiend and the first Death Knights wanting to escape Draenor. It's quite possible they could have been partially influenced by the Jailer, considering their powers and how they were created. The actions of these Death Knights eventually led to the creation of the Lich King, and the previously mentioned idea of capitalizing on the weakened veil around Ice Crown. So, just as a quick recap about what I've been over so far. The Jailer from day one has been using different and multiple forces to slowly but surely destroy the universe and free itself. From what I've stated so far, its main agents seem to be the Nathrazim, however there are others who either know who they serve or unknowingly act in ways that help the Jailer. These characters could include Sargeras, Helia, Kil'jaeden, Gul'dan and Terran Gorfine to name a few big names. So far in this conspiracy timeline I have gone over four possible plans the Jailer has attempted to enact. The first plan was the original demon invasions with the intent of destroying the universe. The second plan was the Legion with the maddening of Sargeras and the creation of the Burning Legion. The intent once again was to destroy the universe. The third plan was Gul'dan. After the defeat of the Legion during the War of the Ancients, the Jailer reprioritized. There was something in the universe stronger than the Legion, Azeroth and her mortal children. So, the new plan was Corrupt Azeroth, not only for a new army, but also a new body, as the Jailer's interactions with Helia possibly bore a way to corrupt Titans, with death magic. Gul'dan would be the catalyst of this plan as he was a target of opportunity, and marked mortals had proven their worth during the War of the Ancients as they managed to stop the Burning Legion. The fourth plan and the plan we are up to is Nazul and the Lich King. Shaping a new plan after the defeat of Gul'dan, this time the Jailer would take a more direct approach, while for the most part, severing its use of the Legion. Through Terran Gorfine, the Jailer probably prodded Ner'zhul down the path that led him to become Lich King. The reason the Lich King was created was to capitalize on the Wicked Veil, vale, assumedly connected to the Moor, in Ice Crown, that was possibly created by yogg during the Titan's invasion of Azeroth. To accomplish this, the Lich King's armaments are placed in ICC, a tower which basically acts as a funnel of death energy, which in one aspect corrupts Azeroth, while in another amplifies the feeding of the Moor generated by the Lich King's armaments. 
Now, where I'd like to say all of this fits into a nice tidy bow, this is also where the contradictions of the Nash regime being loyal and this conspiracy being a thing also start to appear en masse. I mean, after the Nath regime were basically free to roam Azeroth, why didn't they just flip sides? I mean, yes, the Legion could have been used to destroy all resistance on Azeroth, but it's not as if they were a threat. They couldn't even reach the planet. And yes, the forces of Azeroth should not be underestimated, but the amount of caution the Nath regime showed in relation to the Legion at this point in time seems like overkill. This isn't mentioning the Lich King's hatred of the Nath regime, and the caution the Nathrazim took in relation to the Lich King. I mean, there could be an argument made that State Snazul's spirit was strong enough to exert dominance over the Moor, but considering how broken Nazul's spirit was before he was passed through death, it seems unlikely. So, if the Jailer was in control, why did it allow Nazul's hatred of the Nathrazim to flourish, and why did he allow Arthas to kill Marganus? And this isn't mentioning if the Nathrazim were loyal, why didn't they just provide the Jailer with a body so it could move around Azeroth freely? There are more instances like this, but overall they paint a picture of genuine and extreme animosity between the Jailer and the Nathrazim. The only logical reason I could think of that explains these contradictions is that the Jailer and the Nathrazim were at odds and quite possibly never allies. This would explain why the Nathrazim warded themselves against the effects of Frostmourne and why Varimathras, if he noticed Sylvanas falling under the Jailer's influence, betrayed her before the Jailer gained another ally. But overall, in my opinion, this would make the Nathrazim some of the most arrogant and foolish creatures in all of fiction. As in, who looks at something like the Jailer and thinks, you know what, I'm going to use that power to weaken a world. Not conquer it, I might add. Not in desperation, I might add. But as a, oh, that could work. I mean, the Nathrazim can ward off the effects of Frostmourne and the Moor which seems to indicate they've known about the Jailer and what it can do, whether it be from when they were Venthyr or later. Yet, in an act of what I can only describe as sheer stupidity, they thought it would be a good idea to weaponize an ancient evil they obviously knew would become near unstoppable if they lost control of it. All to just weaken a planet. So, on the one hand, we have the Nathrazine being loyal to the Jailer and being a part of an eons-long attempt to destroy the universe. Or we have the Nathrazine. Incredibly reckless fools who, through their actions over the eons, managed to create a perfect set of circumstances which allowed for true death to begin emerging in the universe once more. Now, up until this point, I've been dealing in absolutes. All the Nathrazim serve the Jailer, or none of the Nathrazim serve the Jailer. When looking at the circumstances that have led up to the Shadowlands and the contradictions in certain actions, it becomes clear absolutes won't work. So where I do think a conspiracy involving the Jailer and the Nathrazim has been present since the first demon invasions, I would argue, like all well-written species, that there is nuance within Nathrazim culture. I do not believe all the Nathrazim are loyal to the Jailer. I only believe certain Nathrazim are loyal to the Jailer. Which Nathrazim? I would not know. Maybe it's the currently missing Nathrazim, or the ones that specifically created the Helm of Domination. Overall, however, there is no way I'm willing to chalk up the creation of the Lich King, ICC, and everything that leads up to its creation to sheer stupidity, arrogance, and coincidence. This is also why I kind of consider this whole thing a conspiracy theory. But anyway, we are kind of close to the end, so let's keep going. The fourth plan to destroy the universe, which involves the corruption of Azeroth, is going smoothly. The Lich King begins to expand his power into all the Shadowlands zones we know of. Reverend Reth in the Sand Lane. Bastion in the Valkyr, probably, Maldraxxus in most of the Scourge forces, and I'm willing to say if we didn't stop the Lich King from corrupting Valthyr Dreamweaver during Wrath, he probably would have gained access to Ardenwald. Sticking to the timeline though, we then get the well-known events of the Scourge campaign from Warcraft 3, and better yet, through Arthur's subtle influencing of Illidan, the Legion is defeated again, and this time gives the Lich King the opportunity to break free of the Legion, which he does. All is going well for the Jailer. Then, Illidan happens. He nearly destroys ICC and the Helm of Domination, and in the process causes a leak in the Jailer's power accumulation. Because the Jailer's influence in the physical universe isn't strong enough yet, if the leak doesn't stop, the Jailer's influence within the universe will disappear once again, setting it back to zero. So, as a last resort, the Jailer lets Arthur's take up the throne. 
Unfortunately for the Jailer, as it predicted, it regretted the decision. The Jailer may have had partial if not most control after Arthas took up the helm. Unfortunately, because Arthas's will was still for the most part intact when he put on the helm, enough of his emotions for the living remained stopping the Jailer from unleashing death upon the world, once the Lich King's power returned. There is the slim chance this will to protect the living grew, and was why Arthas' Lich King seemed intent on protecting Azeroth in the long term, but in reality I think the Jailer was fully aware of the Legion's plans to return, and it needed to be ready. So for the most part it entertained the remaining piece of Arthas, making him believe what he was doing was of his own actions. However, as a testament to how cunning the Jailer is, and the fact it's learnt from its past mistakes, during this time, I also think it started to look for ways of subverting Arthas' control from outside the helm and starting its fifth plan. The Jailer could have used its other agents, but as stated earlier, I still think he had agents like Helia dealing with other forces like the Naga. So instead of using his existing forces, I think the Jailer set its sights on a person it either considered a reasonable contingency after her efforts to stop Arthas, or a viable alternative after she broke free from the will of the weakened Lich King, if she actually broke free at all. The person I'm obviously talking about is Sylvanas, and the reason I think the Jailer may have had plans for her ever since Arthas took the Helm of Domination, or ever since her near defeat of Arthas in Quathalas, is the vial of Sylvanas' blood Arthas had on his person, an item players could only obtain by defeating Arthas with Shadowmourne on 25 man difficulty, which at the time was no easy feat and a well hidden piece of lore. So what am I getting at? Well if the Jailer is as cunning as it seems, and respects natural power and or skill as much as it seems, then let's make this clear. Sylvanas, unless the law's been changed, would have won against Arthas if the betrayal of Darkhan had not occurred. In regards to natural skill, she is one of the best fighters and generals in the World of Warcraft universe, if not the best, and that was before she was undead. So assuming you're the Jailer for a second, I ask you this, would you prefer an adept to be sure human prince that leans on your power considerably to become near unstoppable, or one of the most dangerous mortals on Azeroth in life that without your power is near unstoppable? but with your power should technically become an unstoppable monster. I know what I'd want, and it's why I suggested the idea of Sylvanas never actually being free. I'd be willing to bet the Jailer in the long term would have thrown Arthas under the bus, since Sylvanas showed such promise and was undead. However, because of the way things played out, the Jailer had to change its plan slightly. The Jailer allowed or helped Sylvanas break free from the weakened Lich King. It knew Sylvanas would eventually reach an ICC, initially her only goal in Undeath was vengeance against Arthas. The only thing the Jailer needed was a way to slowly corrupt Sylvanas so when she reached ICC she would be willing to align herself with him. This is what I think the Vial of Blood was for. It was the way the Jailer influenced Sylvanas, assuming it still had a connection to Sylvanas similar to a Lich's phylactery, but not. This is also, as I mentioned, why I think Vary Mathras betrayed Sylvanas, especially with the comments he makes in Antorus, which basically imply he's known about what's going on with Sylvanas for ages, and seemed genuinely scared. From here, the rest pretty much falls into place. Sylvanas shatters her soul on ICC, seemingly ending up in the Moor. Similar to Helia Nuzul, she's brought back. In both of those cases, neither was remotely the same when they came back, even if they thought they were. I doubt Sylvanas was different. The only reason I think she managed to retain her personality was either A, because of Annalid's sacrifice, which brought her back, which would imply the Valkyr of Arthas didn't serve the Jailer initially, or B, the Jailer allowed it, knowing her personality was useful, and at the end of the day, Sylvanas, throughout the Age of Night story, and possibly to this day, is still being played like a violin. We don't even know if the weakness of the Veil and the proximity to the Moor was the reason why her soul ended up there in the first place. I mean, Ice Crown is considered unholy ground that empowered the Lich King. Who's to say that did influence where she ended up? Either way, Sylvanas binds herself to the Valkyr, which also probably bound her to the Jailer, 
possibly similar to the soul binds we are going to see in the Shadowlands. And I might as well mention, even if Alad's sacrifice did help keep Sylvanas' personality intact, it didn't matter much, because at the start of Cataclysm, Sylvanas dies. Again. She was obviously raised, but once again, the experience probably left an even greater mark on her soul, pushing her further towards the Jailer's control. So with the Valkyrie in tow, Sylvanas begins what has basically been reiterated by everybody. Sylvanas begins to funnel death towards the moor, and starts to break death. We get the last four expansions, which is basically we mortals defending the Jailer's prize, or feeding its souls with non-stop warfare. Sylvanas tries getting more Valkyrie and Legion, which would have increased her ability to amass souls, fails, feeds the more even more souls within BFA, and basically we reach the present where Sylvanas is incredibly OP because of her soulbind and opens the veil into the moor by releasing the accumulated power of the Hell of Domination. All according to the Jailer's plan. If anything, I think the Jailer is more shocked at how willing we have been to kill each other and how quickly we fed it. Especially in comparison to the first time it tried accumulating power. Also, check out this theory by Solso Breezy, links in the description and the top corner. He gives a really good theory on why Sylvanas might already be aware of the Jailer's influence and countering it. In regards to this theory, give or take a few points, it meshes really well and acts as a very good counterbalance to Sylvanas being controlled by the Jailer. But anyway, that's it. The Jailer, through at least some of the Nathrezim and its own machinations, has at the very least attempted five massive plans to destroy the universe and set itself free. Four of which have failed, while the latest seems very close to succeeding. I would usually do a recap about now, but this theory has gone on long enough. Too convoluted or on point? I'll let you decide. There is just one other thing I want to mention before I finish. I made it clear in this theory I think the Jailer is trying to corrupt Azeroth. I only chose that option because it was the easiest to integrate into this theory. There is one other outcome the Jailer may be looking for. That outcome is the consumption of Azeroth. Why? Well, assuming Azeroth's world soul follows the same basic principles as other spirits, the amount of power Azeroth's soul has would be ridiculous. I assume if the Jailer manages to consume Azeroth, the power of the Maw would expand exponentially, and assumedly become unstoppable. This isn't mentioning that if Argus wasn't tied to another plane of existence, the Jailer may have already consumed one Titan soul explaining its sudden resurgence and why its appetite became something Sylvanas had to feed in BFA. I assume you can imagine how bad it would be if the Jailer got two Titan Souls, especially Azeroth's. Within this theory as well, Harboron would be one of the Jailer's Constellas, and Helia would remain a pawn, just not as important. Thank you for watching.